नीरज कैन यू कैन यू अनम्यूट दैट एच पी लैपटॉप Good morning. Uh, so today is the whole day dedicated to radio astronomy. I'll have two lectures in the first half, and then we will have a hands-on uh, further in the afternoon. And then tomorrow and day after also, you will have lectures on. Uh, Radio astronomy by a night day Monday. We will cover uh, different aspects of what I am going to cover today. I am going to focus primarily on the imaging aspects of radio astronomy, and uh, so I will cover uh, the overall uh, some historical background of radio astronomy, then also the imaging techniques that are involved and the kind of telescopes that we have, and then how can we all understand it together using everything that we have learned so far in the school. Whether it's radiative processes, some image processing, and optics at other wavelengths, right? So this is where uh, it all starts. So electromagnetic waves. Uh, we know the radio waves are also electromagnetic waves, and then uh, the, everything that we know about like EM waves can be encapsulated in these uh, Maxwell's equations. These are partial differential equations, and many of you may have also solved these actually. For uh, for uh, uh, solution of plane wave or propagation of EM waves in any other media, and then you get a solution which tells you that E and B fluctuations are perpendicular to each other, and also to the direction of propagation. Right. So, so all this we knew in uh, 19th century uh, very much, and then how do we detect uh, EM waves? So. Uh, Analytically, we can represent EM waves by through this complex number, uh, this electric field and amplitude and the phase terms is how we can represent them. And when we are talking about detection of EM waves in, uh, as a, in through our eyes or photographs, where we are only concerned with brightness, then this phase information is lost. Mathematically, this can be represented like this: E and E star, star being complex conjugate here, and these brackets here represent the time averaging. So then we have this uh, Morse square term which comes, and then we get this amplitude square. There's nothing but the intensity that we detect uh, in, in, in these uh, through these experiences, right? But we can also consider the superposition of EM waves because we know that EM waves uh, interfere. So we have EM wave uh, consider two EM waves, E1 and E2, and these electric field vectors, and now with the phase difference, right? This A1 exponential I have five, and then this is represents the uh, the phase difference that the E2 has with respect to E1. So now, now if we do the same thing, that the, consider the superposition of these two, even plus E2, and this is the complex conjugate term, then in addition to these intensity corresponding to uh, A1 and A2, we also get this uh, uh, product term, right, 2 A1 E2 cos phi. And if you recall your Young's double slit experiment, you will find that this is what it corresponds to, right, very much. So this is what the interference term that we are talking about when uh, two EM waves interfere with each other. So the interference pattern that we get from uh, EM waves contains information about the spatial structure. Because if you again go back to your lens double slit experiment, you know you recall that we put so many conditions on the type of source that it must be for us to be able to see the phase patterns. It should be quasi-monochromatic, uh, 
compact and whatnot, right? So, so it contains. This is because to be uh, because the interference pattern that we see contains information about the spatial uh, 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 structure of the source and also about the spectral structure of the source. And both of these can actually be uh, uh, inferred, the, provided we can record the interference pattern directly. And uh, this was uh, and Michelson uh, in 20th century and before that actually utilized this uh, and demonstrated and set up a lot of experiments related to this. And we talk about some of those, especially Michelson interferometer today. And then he was actually awarded also for his uh, contributions to this as well. So radio astronomy, uh, you have had already lectures on other bands uh, in astronomy, optical, ultraviolet, and everything. And I'm sure you would have also come across this uh, graph which shows the transparency of atmosphere. What it is showing that radiation that is coming from outside can actually pass through our atmosphere, but with, uh, it has to go through certain opacity, right? There are windows where nothing can actually pass through our atmosphere. So we have to set up uh, those uh, telescopes in space, that is ultraviolet and X-rays. But then there are windows like this where the transparency is complete and we can actually very well do astronomy at uh, ground, this is like the optical window here. When we talk about optic, uh, radio window, it, uh, uh, by definition, it extends from uh, 0.3 uh, millimeter to 30 meters, right? At the highest frequency, we are talking about something like terahertz, and at the, at the lower bound, approximately corresponds to 10 megahertz, and we'll talk about some of these all in next few slides as well. The interesting thing about uh, radio window is that uh, there is a lot of uh, man-made activity that also takes place in this window. For example, we have microwave ovens which would operate at the same frequencies. We have mobile phones, Wi-Fi, communication routers that we use, FM radio, TV transmitters. All of these actually radio signals in radio window. So this means that this window is very busy. We produce a lot of signal uh, on ground which is very strong and can actually uh, interfere with the signal that is very weak from the space. So you would find that a lot of or most of the radio telescopes currently are actually located in very isolated uh, places. That is, there is uh, far away from the cities, no urbanization. If that is not possible, then one would find that around the radio uh, observatory sites, various restrictions are imposed. For example, visitors, when they approach radio observatory, they are requested to switch off their mobile phones. You will find that at uh, radio observatories, you would have uh, things like tube lights, you would have on the constant bulb, which is the former one, so initial fluctuations can generate interference. You wouldn't also see microwave ovens there because they can also generate interference that can actually interfere with the what one is trying to detect with the telescope. So lower bound that is at one terahertz is coming from some of the uh, molecules, especially water vapor that are present in the atmosphere that uh, actually interferes, uh, that can actually absorb radiation. So beyond this, if you want to observe, like at very high uh, frequencies, beyond terahertz or so, we have to again uh, go to space. But below this, as well, close to terahertz and uh, millimeter frequencies, we need to build telescopes at uh, sites which are at very high altitude, at very high uh, environment. So if you look at uh, Atagama Large Millimeter Array, for example, this is built in Chile, which is a radio telescope, right? And then further, if we want to understand the uh, low frequency bound, that comes from the uh, ionospheric refraction. If you look at EM wave propagation through uh, plasma, then you come across the concept of plasma frequency, which implies that if the frequency is lower than certain value, which in case of ionospheric electron density turns out to be 10 megahertz, then the refractive index is negative and actually uh, it, uh, EM waves which have frequency lower than that cannot further, right? So, uh, so this means that again, like at, at close to 10 megahertz, and if you want to observe at further lower frequencies, then you have to build radio telescopes in space, and and and, uh, and, and you will uh, find that uh, because to avoid radio frequency interference and also atmospheric interference that happens, uh, that uh, there are now already efforts to build telescopes in radio telescopes in space and even on the far side of the world because that would uh, overcome both these. Uh, limitations. So what's the uniqueness of radio astronomy? Let's uh, talk about that. Uh, what we are seeing here is the Milky Way, Milky Way, but at different wavebands. So at the top, you have radio continuum at 408 megahertz, then atomic hydrogen. This is 21 centimeter line. This is also in a radio window. 
Then radio content number 2.5 gigahertz, this is molecular hydrogen map, but actually made using observations of carbon monoxide because molecular hydrogen is very hard to observe directly. Then we have other bands, like this is infrared, mid-infrared, near-infrared, optical, x-rays. So these are all like other wave bands which are there. And you, you can see that like Milky Way as such looks very different in each one of these uh, wave bands. For example, like in the top panel, what we are seeing here is the how the Milky Way would look at low frequencies from the radiative processes. Now you know that the most of the radiation that we are seeing here in this map is actually coming from the synchrotron, which is relativistic particles uh, under the influence of magnetic field in the galaxy. So mostly supernova is related to that uh, phenomenon, right? And when we come to this atomic hydrogen, this is vector line, this is 21 centimeter line that uh, we are seeing. So you can see that it's much more confined to the plane of the galaxy, whereas emission here is much more extended and diffuse. Next, we come to uh, radio spectrum emission again, but now it's at higher frequencies, 2.5 gigahertz. So here we are not uh, only seeing a component of non thermal emission, which is coming from synchrotron, but we are also seeing PP emission, which is a M thermal emission, and that is now corresponding to the S2 region. So you can see that now this is also getting more confined to the plane of the galaxy because most of the star forming regions in S2 region are in the plane of the galaxy, right? That's what it is demonstrating. And then there are these other windows like uh, infrared. We, we, we are probably looking at older stars when we look at ultraviolet. Uh, or optical, we are looking at younger stars in optical there is and ultraviolet there is also a lot of dust obscuration which is seen through these dark patches, but no such patches are uh, or obscuration patches are seen in the radio window. So that's one of the main advantages of a uh, radio window that it provides a dust unbiased view of the universe. So not only that we are looking at certain physical processes which are not really uh, detectable or observable at other windows, we are also able to look at the universe in a very dust unbiased way. So not only that these things are complementary, each of these wavelengths are complementary to each other, but they also bring out certain information to the unique, right? So that's a way to look at it. So radio waves uh, have been detected for a very long time, but the radio astronomy takeoff was not very smooth. This is some kind of historical background that I'm going to uh, talk to you uh, in after. So why that was uh, that was the case? Uh, we, we talked about Maxwell's equations, 19th century, and around the same time, people also detected EM waves at uh, infrared and X-rays. And then uh, it was with the Hertz experiment. Then uh, radio waves were also known, and it was uh, and as soon as these waves were detected, uh, EM waves were detected at the uh, wave bands. There was also uh, the simultaneous thought that. Uh, how about we look at the sky or these astrophysical objects at these other wavelengths as well, and what is it that we can learn from them? But in those days, that is like more than 100 years ago, most of the understanding of astrophysical objects or the universe was based on thermal processes. By thermal processes, I mean that there is an object which radiates radiation by virtue of the temperature, its, its temperature, yes. uh, and, and, and we can describe brightness as a function of wavelength of frequency using this. Band function. And of course, at lower frequencies, we can also define its diligence use limit, which tells us that the brightness is actually proportional to the square of the frequency, right? So, this is how a non thermal process is described. So, this is the shape of the system, right? This is how it will look. And, 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 if we, and we know that uh, stars are black body, sun is a black body also. And if we put a sun, our sun, at one parsec, then it would give a radiation of 0.3 micro Janskis. And one Janski and Jansky is the unit we use uh, to measure flux density in radio window, and when Jansky is 10 to minus 26 watt per meter per So it's a very small uh, quantity, and uh, if we look at the number of 0.3 micro Jansky, even with the most sensitive telescopes that we have today, uh, it would take many tens of hours to actually barely detect uh, this uh, level of flux density. And why I'm talking about one parsec? Because that's the dis approximate distance to the nearest star. Uh, that we have. So you can see that like if we just uh, start to argue from the perspective of black bodies, then you see that it will be very difficult to detect anything which is there uh, out in the universe at radio window if we just move stars yes. and, and thermal processes. So first is actually so initially there were a lot of experiments. Uh, people sort of uh, tried building some instruments and trying to detect, uh, but nothing was detected. For the two reasons, one is that you can appreciate that uh, uh, the radiation that we want to detect is weak. And another thing was that in those days, actually, 
the understanding of ionosphere was also in the plot that it was because although I told you one of the initial slides itself that if observations are below 10 megahertz or so, then we cannot actually, we will not receive anything from the space because ionosphere will not allow anything of it. So to conduct or to set up an experiment, there are two things of uh, utmost importance. One is uh, that to know that what is the expected strength of the signal because that would tell you that what how powerful your instrument should be or how deep your observation should be in terms of time integration, for example. And, and second thing is that what frequency you should carry out that uh, observation because uh, depending on uh, what is the underlying physical process, that physical process may not be actually uh, giving optimal amount of radiation at the frequency you want to target. So you have to optimize both the things. So let's look at how this thing, these two things played out uh, in the development of Radio astronomy. So first detection of radio waves, this was done by Carl Jansky, but it was not uh, directed toward detection of uh, radio waves from space. It was actually to study a certain noise that was coming with the uh, transatlantic communication signal. Uh, this we are talking about uh, mid twenties, and so so he he built uh, an instrument like this, and his observations were at twenty point five megahertz. So you can see that he is observing pretty close to. Ionospheric cutoff, and then he started investigating what is it that is introducing this uh, uh, continuous noise uh, in the signal. Initially, he found that some of this could be uh, due to local thunderstorms and other terrestrial phenomena, but at the same time, he noted in his signal that there is a certain uh, periodicity that there is always this uh, signal which comes, uh, which peaks at a certain time and then it goes down. Another thing he noticed is that this actually periodicity is not. Nearly 24 hours, which is actually 23 hours 56 minutes, right? That's the side we are doing. So, using this, it was also possible to argue that this, the origin of this is actually not a risk, it must be coming from uh, outside, actually, right? So, this, and then further, he also was able to pinpoint that the, the, the source of this radiation is actually from the, in the Sagittarius constellation that is coming from the center of the galaxy. So, that's you can call us formally the beginning of the uh, radio astronomy. This is the first detection of radio waves from astronomical sources. Then uh, this was taken over by Grother River, uh, who uh, called as the first professional radio astronomer because not only he observed a number of objects systematically, he carried out uh, uh, observations of radio objects at multiple frequencies, but he also actually uh, took uh, uh, published these in uh, results in journal. So he was inspired by uh, findings of Jansky, uh, and he in fact uh, also approached Bell Labs. And Jansky was working uh, at that time when he uh, carried out his experiment, and, and he wanted to sort of continue uh, that kind of work, but his request was turned down because Bell Labs was very much interested in the commercial applications of this and not so much in the astronomy at that time. So they did not uh, accept that uh, proposition. So what Rotary did that, he, so he took up another job as an engineer, but he single-handedly built a 10 meter, meter parabolic reflector in his backyard. This is like just as a hobby, working off time weekends and things like that. And he built first world's first astronomical radar telescope, you can say. And then using this, he actually started observing the sky. And his first goal was to see actually that, okay, can I observe the objects, uh, uh, radio emission that Jansky has detected? And as I was telling you that in those days, he understood sky from the basis of thermal processes. So he thought that, hey, Jansky carried out his observation as 22 megahertz. And if you go back to Planck's equation, radius limit, we'll find that the brightness is actually proportional to the square of frequency. So he thought that, okay, why not observe it at a higher frequency? So he set up the observations at 33 megahertz, 3.3 gigahertz. He detected nothing. And then, but he did not stop. Then he said that, okay, let me try at 900 megahertz. Then also he did not detect anything. Eventually he moved to 160 megahertz. This is 1938. And then he was able to detect an uh, you know, object. Uh, the mission that Jansky detected and uh, his telescope was also larger. So he was also had a higher uh, spatial resolution. I'll talk about why a larger telescope would correspond to a high spatial resolution from the optics perspective. And he also observed these objects at multiple frequencies. He detected Milky Way, he detected Sun, Cassiopeia A, Cygnus A, Cygnus X. These are some of the brightest objects in the sky. 
and uh, this is like uh, and he did his observation 160 and 480 megahertz and from these uh, observations the two frequencies was also able to demonstrate that the radiation that we are observing is actually non thermal that's what it was called because it shows behavior which is completely opposite what we expect from the thermal phenomena in this case the actually emission is stronger as we go to the lower frequency so if this is thermal then the non thermal is completely uh, orthogonal to that and at the same time Ginsberg and other uh, researchers uh, developed the theory of synchrotron emission and they showed that like uh, such a phenomenon can explained by relativistic electrons in magnetic field. And so you can see that how observations, experiments, and uh, like uh, observational theory, and also like uh, sort of uh, uh, the knowledge like where to carry out the experiment, they all develop uh, simultaneously. So once this was done, then uh, there was much better understanding of how uh, the Radio sky may look like, and then people started, especially after the Second World War, there were a lot of uh, resources that became available to do radio astronomy, and, and then people started observing different types of objects. So, so in next few slides, I will show you some of the things so, which were discovered for the first time at radio astronomy, and they actually have now like two foot clone trees uh, as of now. One, one of them would be quasar. So, one of the things uh, radio astronomers detected was there's a lot of this light objects in the sky they detected. But they didn't know what they are actually. Right? So, so some of these were then followed up at optical wavelengths also. And, and what was found that actually that these are not local because from optical spectra it was possible to detect spectral lines and from there it was possible to determine at what redshift they may be. So CC273 was on such first object and then its redshift was found to be 0 0.158. So one so the moment we so when we observe a certain object in the sky we measure its flux density. But the moment we know its uh, rest shape, we can uh, convert it into luminosity. That is actually the uh, energy output that it has. And then from this, it was straight away possible to infer that these are actually some of the very uh, luminous objects in the sky. And again, they cannot be explained by the simple energy output that is coming from the star. These were uh, active galactic nuclei. And this was the discovery of first uh, quasars in the 50s. And now we have more than 1 million quasars now known which are actually used to study not only the evolution of black holes in the universe but also they are used to look at uh, uh, all the intervening matter that is there between uh, this uh, quasar and us actually right you may not that. Uh, i'm sure you have gone to other lectures where people talk about how quasars can be used to study interstellar medium of intervening galaxies and also the intergalactic right so all this all that field all, all these things that we are talking about actually started with this then a discovery of h 21 centimeter line. Van der Hulst in Netherlands predicted this in 1944. This was part of his thesis working with uh, Jan Oort. And then as soon as this was predicted theoretically, astronomers thought that okay, let, let us uh, try to detect it because uh, you know that uh, uh, through continuum emission, we can actually look at a variety of physical processes, but a spectral line brings with it uh, some very unique information which is lit, which is redshift, that's one thing. And second thing is like the kinematics of the gas that is uh, embedded in it. So these two are very important information that we will not be able to get uh, otherwise. So there was a lot of interest in detecting uh, spectral line. And also our hydrogen is the most abundant element. So like if there's a spectral line is can be just detected, it sort of holds a lot of promise. So first detection was made by in 1951, but immediately like within a year, like there were also detections made by other uh, groups in Netherlands and also in Australia. And now you know that like it's an excellent group of uh, galaxy evolution and study galaxies. Then discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation. This was centipede so detected uh, theoretically. The presence of such a radiation was predicted by Alpha Herman in 1948, but the detection actually uh, was uh, carried out by Pangeas and Wilson. And this, and again at Bell Labs, but this time, a kind of situation is very similar to what uh, uh, we encountered, encountered in the case of Jansky. Uh, Jansky was exploring transatlantic communication, but now uh, more than 40 years have passed. So, like now, they were looking at uh, details of satellite communication. Right? And, and again, they found certain noise. They were exploring that we what is the source of this noise, and, and they detect, ended up detecting cosmic microwave background. 
and now all of us know that the kind of impact that it has made uh, uh, the discovery in our understanding of the universal structure formation. And the discovery of pulsars, uh, like this work, uh, we know that these are associated with uh, rotating uh, this uh, <coughs> magnetized neutron stars. And uh, but initially, when such pulses were detected from the space, people even thought that they may be coming from actually some extraterrestrial uh, civilization. And uh, but eventually, it was again possible to pinpoint uh, that this is actually not the case. And there are many such objects in the sky, and uh, the Nobel uh, and pulsars have been fit with two Nobels actually. One was for the discovery, which went in 1974, and then in 1993, Hulse and Taylor pulsar. They were awarded because this was a, in a binary system, and then this was used to uh, obtain some really nice tests for the Einstein relativity. And I think tomorrow and day after Avinash probably talk more about time domain astronomy and pulsars. So you will learn more about uh, about these things. So I will I'll stick myself more to the imaging aspects of uh, astronomy. Through these very early basic discoveries which happened in the 60s, we can uh, straight up say that radio astronomy is actually essential to our understanding of celestial objects and cosmology. Just providing us a view of the universe which we cannot obtain at any other time. It, it is as simple as that. Right. So, how do we detect signals at radio waves? So, if we want to uh, sort of uh, look at an example which is nearest to us, then the nearest to us is the uh, GMRT, Giant Infrared Radio Telescope. It's just about 90 kilometers from Pune. All of you must try to visit it while you are there. Uh, and it consists of 30 dishes. It's, uh, and each dish is 45 meter diameter. And this dish has spread over 25 kilometers. So one of the things uh, that we want to do today is to understand that why do we actually want to have this instead of just one large dish from which we can detect signal. Isn't it look like a much simpler uh, uh, setup than consider like you make 30 dishes, each one is so large and spread it over 25 kilometers. And I will also show you certain configuration that how these dishes are arranged. And that also like it's not like they have been just sort of uh, uh, arranged on the basis of convenience, there is a lot of thought that goes into it. So what is it that uh, specific to uh, detection at radio waves that we have to do this kind of uh, arrangements, right? That's something you want to understand. But this is how typical uh, radio telescopes today would look like. NGMIT is one of the most sensitive telescopes at So uh, if, if you talk about just the very basic detector at uh, uh, radio wavelength, then we can look at a uh, dipole antenna. This is also something which Hertz had used uh, in 1887 in his uh, experiment. Uh, this is how it would uh, look like this. So, conductor, this is a center fed half a dipole antenna, which is what uh, you are seeing in this uh, figure. And if we want to look at its uh, response or its uh, far field radiation pattern, then this is what it would uh, look like. This is how it will be. Uh, if, uh, in, in, in the polar uh, coordinates, it's uh, donut shaped in 3D. If you look at it along this orientation, so it acts as an omnidirectional antenna if you install it vertically. So, this is how it will be. And then along this plane, you can see that there will be no response, right? So, what it, it implies that in this uh, large region, large angular space, we can actually uh, receive a lot of radiation vertically and it's very weak direction. This for example. So, what is uh, uh, what it uh, what does this mean is that it's actually uh, is a very nice television antenna in the sense like a lot of people can receive signal uh, from this, but it is not necessarily a very good telescope because like when we are uh, we, when we want a good telescope, we want two basic properties from it. One is that it must be sensitive because then only I can detect uh, signals uh, from pain or distant objects. And a second thing is uh, that it should have certain directivity, which means that like if I'm receiving certain radiation, I should be able to tell whether it's coming from this object or that object. Like if I cannot tell that, then it does not have. So this is what is meant by directivity. So even though that whole the basic detector is an integral part of uh, 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 detecting radio waves, this is not not the best telescope that we can have uh, as such. And I'll I I'll come I I will refine these statements as we uh, go along. So right, so these are two aspects we are looking at. 
and it should have very good gain and it should have very good value. So let's see one two mean by these two. We can start by defining some of these actually uh, formally. So uh, this is the the Sentinel's power pattern. Any arbitrary, we can. It, so what typically what an entropic power pattern will have? It will it will consist of a main law. This is where the response is maximum. But in addition, it will also have what we call as side loads, right? These are the side loads that we have. It can also have certain back loads also at the same time. So we can define something called beam solid angle, and like this, this this is the power pattern which is normalized to the maximum power. So this if this is P max, and we take this power pattern and normalize using this P max. So this is what P m means here. So this is uh, how we define this beam solid angle, right? So this is the total power that is uh, radiated. And then we can also on the main beam solid angle. So the only difference with respect to the previous definition is that we this integral is open, only the main beam. Okay. So using what's called main beam efficiency, like eta b omega and b divided by omega uh, solid angle, right? So so the ratio of this actually uh, determines that, that how well the power is concentrated in the main beam. But this does not mean, mean, mean that it has got a very high resolution. Right? It should not be confused with the resolution part. It just means that most of the power, if, the, if this value is very high, main beam efficiency is very good, this would mean that most of the power is concentrated in the main beam and not in the side flow. Right? That's what it means. So what are the basic components a telescope would have, right? We'll talk about like whether it's single dish, multiple dishes, whatever it is, but we are collecting some signal that is coming out of it, which is represented by this uh, triangle here. So then these are the main components that we have. It will have a low noise amplifier that will be the first stage that is coming. And then there will be a mixer actually, and then another amplifier and detector. So what is, why do we have a, a mixer here? Because what happens that the radiation may be coming at all sorts of frequencies, right? Today I want to observe an object at 1.4 gigahertz like because 21 centimeter line is there. Tomorrow I say that I want to observe CO and that line is let's say 115 gigahertz. So we cannot make a uh, optimize our electronics for all these different changes. So what we instead is done that is various signals that are coming they can actually be uh, using a mixture transfer to a single frequency and then the rest of the electronics can is then optimized with respect to that, right? And then, of course, we have this amplifier line because we're detecting weak signals, so we want to amplify them uh, prior to detection. But before we do anything, even before the mixer stage, we, we, we do want to put a, a low noise amplifier there uh, at the first stage itself because if you go back to your uh, basic electronics, uh, you would find that the maximum noise that gets added to the signal happens at the first stage of the amplification. Right? So if I, if I put this thing anywhere later, then, I, then it, it, it would actually sort of uh, not be quite right. So this is the reason that you have this. So this is key to keep this energy in mind. This is how uh, a, a basic telescope will be set up. And so what we are interested in, so this is the total system temperature that we get. So what is meant by temperature here? So if you go back to our Planck's uh, formula, we could define a temperature there in the religious approximation, right? So, so this, that's the temperature that we are talking about. So it has nothing to do with black, keeping black body or not. Right? We have just related plus brightness with respect to the uh, temperature that's using that. So that's what the system temperature is. So we are still talking about brightness. Here, so, so we are interested in the antenna temperature, right? And TR is actually the coming from the rest of this electronics, which is there. System, but the total system temperature is nevertheless Ca plus Pi. So naturally, the signal that I am getting will have certain fluctuations or noise in it, right? And this noise is what will uh, uh, determine my ability to detect faint signal. It means that I must have ways to actually reduce these fluctuations or noise that are there in the signal. So how do we? Uh, what What is that? It will depend on. It will depend on the system temperature here. And then in the denominator, we have delta nu and tau. Delta nu is the bandwidth over which I am collecting signals. So we can think of it as the number of events per unit time. And tau is the time over which I am integrating the signal. Right? So the square root of these actually would uh, determine uh, that uh, how well I can use the noise. So you would find that uh, the design of radio telescopes or even det detection of experiment 
uh, astrophysical signal in general, there is always uh, uh, like uh, an effort to increase the bandwidth to reduce the noise and also to increase the integration time as well to reduce the noise. This is where this is the uh, basis of it, right? So to increase the signal to noise ratio, which will be TA, right? This is what our signal of interest and delta T. We have to make this as large as possible. So how would we do that? We need to increase the area of the detector because that is basically the raw photons that I am collecting. So larger the area, more photons I am collecting. So this should be made as large as possible. And then of course delta nu and tau also we can. And then if we can increase the reduce the thesis as much system temperature as much as possible. So these are the considerations that we have to have to make a good sensitive telescope. Most of these ideas are very general, although I am putting them in the context of the radio <coughs> So let's talk about these words in a bit more detail. So again, so collect collect as much power as possible. So power received by antenna is given by this. This is the effective area, and this is the flux density. This is the bandwidth I'm over which I am collecting. So what would we mean? What what we what do we mean here is that my if I have an antenna with nice directivity, then uh, I will have much less problem because let's say if there, if it has significant side lobes, then it will also pick up signal from this source which is far away or of not interest to me. What this would do? This would increase the confusion and this will also increase the system temperature for me. So this radiation is anywhere coming into the system. So you want to avoid, uh, say, radiation. So have uh, design telescopes which will have good uh, in beam efficiency. And then we come to the directivity, which is, uh, as I was telling you, is a different thing. In case of directivity, we want to be able to tell that these objects, A and B, both of which are being now seen through the main lobe, but they are actually a different objects so now. So that is related to the dipole. So now you can understand that a simple dipole on its own uh, it has poor uh, properties and will be adequate for some of these uh, applications that we are talking about. So how do we detect signals and radio wavelengths in, in that case? So most common uh, design that you would see is that one actually has a parabolic reflector and then at the prime focus here, one puts a uh, dipole antenna or a horn feed or whatever detector that you want to use to detect the signal. So what does this parabolic detector does is that you can understand in the following way that any plane wave front that is coming from uh, the zenith actually will actually then be converted into a spherical wave front and all these uh, secondary wave fronts then will combine in phase at the focus. Then you can put the detector. Right? So that's what actually this parabolic reflector is doing. It is actually acting as a very nice okay. And and it did, and also has very nice directional properties uh, that this uh, dipole which I put here does not have, and so so it actually leads to a setup which is uh, we have much better uh, directivity uh, and gain for you. Right? And the resolution in this case, you know, for a reflector or circular pulsar is approximately lambda by d. Does everyone agree with that? Right? It is lambda by d. But in next few slides, we are, we are going to see that well, where does this lambda by t come from and then how does this affect the kind of imaging that we can like, I mean, like, also I think that we are going to talk about like, from optics, so you can apply to any particular thing. But now, we, from the discussion that we have had so far, we can understand that actually, uh, like, instead of just having a dipole ground, it would be better to have a dish and uh, this kind of a setup with a parabolic reflector, which will actually uh, use for detection. The resolution here is lambda by d, right? So lambda is the resolution. Uh, this is this so this is your resolution, right? So uh, straight away the the logic tells us that we should try to make dishes or radio telescopes with dishes as large as possible, right? Because it would increase my gain. I'm collecting more and more photon because dishes are larger, and then. Since uh, the diameter is coming here in the denominator, this means that uh, a larger dish would also have a higher resolution in the space, right? So, make larger dishes and everything will be fine. So, uh, simple logic tells us. So, that's what people did in early days. So, this is 
past telescope in Australia has a diameter of 60 boson. It's huge, actually. Right? If we talk about the largest uh, steerable dish, it's a green bank telescope in USA. It's 100 meter diameter. Right? It operates from about 100 megahertz to uh, approximately, I think, 100 megahertz. It's slightly higher than that also. This is the largest telescope. One has uh, previously we had uh, RSCO telescope uh, for uh, at a diameter of 300 meter. It's not scalable, and then and and you know that it's no, the, no longer exists. It collapsed a few years ago. But now we have uh, in China 500 meter aperture spherical telescope, fast operational telescope. Again, this RSCO is was fast. They are not steerable dishes, so that's a difference because you that like as we go beyond 100 meters or so, it becomes very hard, very engineering wise and also uh, cost wise to make large dishes which are steerable. So, this is pretty much the limit of it. But is this good enough actually? It was good enough for a very long time. But let's look at uh, how the size of uh, an aperture would actually uh, affect. Uh, the imaging, because that's what we eventually want to do. We're looking at the sky to make images of the objects that we, we see. Even if it's spectra, spectral line, we can make images of the spectral line also, right? So finally, we're talking about the image. For that, let's go back to some of the things that we have, may have already come across in Fourier optics. And I'm sure you have uh, done many of these things. So, so what is it that we are uh, talking about uh, here? With the, the very simple idea is that, like, if we have, let's say, a plane in front which is passing by and then it is obstructed by an aperture, then what would happen that each point on this aperture is actually will become a source of second phase difference and then these would actually interfere with each other. This is the basic idea that you come across when we try to understand interference and diffraction. And what happens as a result of this is that uh, this uh, uh, wavefront, which is incident on with this. Uh, uh, Aperture actually is able to eliminate parts of the screen, let us say, beyond it, uh, in, in which if we just apply simple ray optics, it wouldn't, right? That's, that, that's the simple uh, consequence of it. So, in, in, in this geometry, if you try to put like this is let's say x and y, we are looking at y is actually the uh, plane of the board here or, or the slide here, then if d is the field here at point p, which is caused by this uh, dx element. And then if I want to integrate over x and y, this is what I will get. And if I want to determine what will be the overall in uh, our field, and I replace x uh, in the units of wavelength, that is x, x, is x by lambda, that's something which we will do in optics with common, that is the measure distances in the units of wavelength. Uh, because that makes a physical sense that if we just make these substitutions and <coughs> do this integration, we find a simple expression that is how the power field uh, pattern is related to the distribution of field and the aperture. And this is nothing but your simple Fourier transform. Right. This is the basic uh, starting point of Fourier uh, optics. But we will also not stop there. We will also do uh, some basic uh, things that we know from Fourier uh, transforms. And, and Fourier transforms, you know, like again, you could have from. Uh, Starting from the Fourier series, that you could take any uh, periodic function and then actually represent it by a uh, series of sine times. That's the basic idea. In this extent to infinity, then you have the continuous uh, Fourier transform, right? That's the idea. So, th so these two slides are just to sort of refresh what you already <coughs> know. So, if we, so these are the simple Fourier transform expressions that we come across. This. Uh, in, 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 in lot of our, not just in optics, quantum mechanics, it also comes uh, uh, to us. So if we have, let's say, this uh, a single slit like that, right? And uh, mathematically, we can represent it like uh, like a box function, right? It has it has certain finite value over this uh, gap D, and it's zero uh, everywhere. So if I take this and I do this integration, then its uh, solution turns out to be uh, this. Uh, Value, uh, which is actually nothing but the sink function. And this is how it looks like, right? It has got this maxima, and then it also has these uh, side loads. So, the effect 
pattern of an uniform uh, uh, illuminated aperture is the same function. Right? This is something which you would have seen the uh, your optics very much, and you can now you know that you can also get it from the optics very simply. And then there are these various uh, Fourier transform pairs. You can visualize them as different kind of apertures also in the box. Box function, which is saying if you have triangle, you will have same square. Then, if you have like a pair of uh, delta functions, then it would be cosine in that case. Right? So, this is like very much uh, your uh, situation of uh, idealized, uh, very narrow double slits. That's the situation that we have. And then there are some very simple uh, Fourier transform theorems uh, that are very useful. I'm depressing them because we will. Need these ideas when we want to understand the imaging at radio wavelengths and also how can the design of an aperture actually affect the imaging quality. So, linearity is fine, similarity is just that we are talking about if I have a narrow function in one domain, corresponding to the other one in the other domain, shift is translation in one domain is corresponding to phase shift in the other domain, this exponential term is actually into phase shift, and then, and then the most interesting one is the convolution theorem, right? And the convolution function is this fx and gx. This star here represents a convolution operation, and this is how it is represented. This is nothing but just a shift and multiply of it, right? So Fourier transform of the convolution of two functions is equal to the product of their Fourier transform. Right? Yes. Think to remember. Just very simple statement. Let's just keep this in mind and see how what all this does to or how all this helps us in understanding some simple imaging ideas. So let us say, starting from uh, a very simple lens double slit experiment, which was this, let's say, represented by two delta functions here. We know that the fringe pattern is like cosine. Right? Very simple, we you know. Now let's say I want to understand from this uh, what would happen if, if these two uh, slits have got finite width. So a more realistic experiment that we have, right? So, uh, this, this, this box function represents your finite slit. And how can I obtain uh, two slits from this? Is by convolution of this box function with these two delta functions. Right? So, it will be just you take this function and shift and multiply here. So, it will become non zero in these parts. right? So, this is the output you would get you know, on this side. So, we know for the transform of this is. For sign for your transform, this box function is same, and from the convolution theorem, if I go back, then that actually what I should get on the bottom right corner is the product of the Fourier transform of these two. And indeed, this is what you get, right? You get point by point multiplication of these two, same, and your cosine, right? Isn't this what one gets from what the Young uh, double slit experiment that your cosine is actually modulated by the Diffraction pattern that you get from the same right? So, this is how we can actually understand it, not just understand it in hand, but actually very uh, uh, accurately derive it from the Fourier optics that what is it that this will look like. So, knowing some of these simple ideas and also the Fourier transform pairs, we can actually very easily and in a very rapidly actually uh, do. I understand what will be the imaging response of a particular aperture. So this is just whatever I talked about corresponding to the uh, yen double slit with finite width. You have this is a single slit diffraction. This is the double slit interference, right? And then what you get double slit amplitude is this, right? Modulation, modulation of these two. And then if you want intensity, nothing but just the square of this, right? So sine square and cosine square. This is it. This is how you can understand the whole thing that is. Uh, Going on. So now come back to our uh, situation of dish. Let's look at what happens in the case of circular aperture. So the kind of uh, simple exercise that we did here, right? In this case, in the polar coordinates, we can also con consider the situation of a circular aperture. And then, if we go through the maths, then what one finds that. Uh, <clears throat> The response in this case is actually uh, is an a Aries case. That's what we call it, right? And and mathematically, it is nothing but the Bessel function. So what what is the half hour beam fit corresponding to it? It is 1.02 lambda by d and null of it is at 1.02 lambda. Right? 
So now you know exactly where that lambda comes here. And whenever you look at <coughs> these numbers, 1.0 to 1.2, you also know that how they must have been derived where they actually come from. So there are a couple of other things, interesting things that are uh, happening in this. If you look at AHJ, there is not just the main group, but there are also the side groups, right? Which are there present. So there are two aspects of imaging that we must uh, pay attention to. One is that whenever we have an aperture, aperture which means that it can actually uh, receive radiation up to a certain distance and then it ends, right? And then it can end abruptly, which is happening in the case of, let's say, this uh, dashed line here, right? Or it can uh, uh, end more gradually with some gradation, with some grading, right? Which is printed by a soil line. If it is like this, actually, like a box function, then what this leads to uh, a main lobe, which is actually narrower in the relative sense, but it actually also has a very strong side lobe. And, and that's again like coming from the basic Fourier transform uh, understanding that wherever we have these sharp edges in one domain, they will correspond to this uh, uh, strong fringing in, in the other domain, right? It will call your Fourier transform. Right? That's what is happening all the way. The, the idealized example is the Gaussian function, right? You have one nice Gaussian in one domain, you get a Gaussian in other domain as well, right? The only thing which Changes is that the narrow one corresponds to the broader one in these two domains, but otherwise the all the other properties remains very nicely behaved. So in, in instead of this box function, if I actually consider uh, something which is uh, which has a degradation there, then it would actually give me uh, uh, my what is called com compromise here is the extent is compromised here. So of course the main lobe you can see that is uh, extended because my resolution has now gone down, gone down because of that, but uh, the relative side and the side loads are actually also reduced, right? So, which means that if I'm making an image of a star, then it will have uh, not just the image of this point source and here, but it will also have these uh, fringes here. And if I'm using this more well behaved kind of a response, then these two things will be suppressed. And why that is important? Because, like, if there, are, there happens to be uh, two nearby objects, for example then in that case, it will limit my possibility to resolve these two objects, right? This is coming from the radius criteria, which tells you that I, I, I can actually resolve two objects if the null of one falls on the peak of the other. So this is where this 1.22 lambda by d peak the resolution comes into it. Right? So, so the design of an aperture or a telescope in this case, the telescope would actually require us to look at uh, how we can uh, actually not only achieve maximum gain in resolution, but also my imaging should be well behaved, right? I don't want the situation where like these secondary lobes are infinitely strong, right? Then it will lead to an image which is not useful, very sensitive, but there's so much confusion in that image. You cannot tell what is the real source and what is not. So let's try to summarize uh, what we have gone through. Telescope resolution collecting. Let's so collect resolution is 1.2 lambda by d. We understand. We also understand why we make uh, dishes like this, <clears throat> because we get better directivity here. And then the geometric collecting area is like pi by 4 d squared, right? So uh, this is the geometric area of the dish, and this is what will be the, we can, we can take as the collecting area, provided the dish is uniformly and completely illuminated, right? So if the feed is here, then by being completely illuminated, it means that it receives radiation from the entire dish. Not a portion of it. So I can design a circuit to see away from a certain portion of it. Right? Because it will also have its power pattern, right? So I can design it such that the power pattern has got a certain fit to it. So why is it that uh, but why is it such an issue actually, right? So there's because so let's go through some of the trade-offs actually, and, and it's very easy to appreciate that there are situations in which we would like to design uh, our uh, telescope such that my uh, effective area, that is the area over which I am actually receiving the radiation, is less than the geometry. Right? So this happens when dish is not uniformly eliminated. First thing that we would want to do this because like if uh, my feed is pointing like this, so then if it goes up to the edges, 
then it would also can receive radiation from the ground, right? Below one, right? So that would increase the system temperature, that would use the performance of my telescope. So so idea is to remove, reduce the so for this reason we should uh, we, we may consider uh, some uh, illumination which is like not well, goes up to the edges actually and again uh, we may also want to actually reduce the illumination as we go outside to sort of keep this well behaved as well right so that's another reason So these are, uh, so another thing that may happen that uh, we have been talking about that, okay, we are putting this uh, heat at the prime focus, but you can see that anything that we put here is actually also going to produce a blockage here, isn't it? And this blockage actually uh, would, uh, again, uh, broaden your uh, main loop and also introduce the side lobes uh, as well, uh, increase the side lobes as well. Uh, so what what is it that uh, to be done? In, in certain design of the dishes, actually, this uh, heat actually is actually put off axis. So this is one example of heated dish, heated scope. It's currently operational in South Africa. It's uh, talking about this because it's the most sensitive telescope at centimeter wavelengths. And then this uh, will also in next few years will be incorporated to square kilometer array. So this is a square kilometer array P cursor as well. So we'll, I will talk a little bit more about this today and then in the hands-on experiment also we will focus on some data that is taken with data and then when you will have an SK talk later this year we will talk about this yeah, as well. So here you can see that there is a, a primary reflector here then there is a secondary one here and then the feeds are there and what this uh, offset Brugerian configuration has done is that cleared up uh, this like this very minimal blockage of the primary reflector. So what this does is it produces an image response in, in, in which actually the side lobes are very, very low, they are very minimized. So up to this point, one can argue that like, okay, we can use single dish phase for a lot of, uh, to achieve a lot of uh, desirable properties of like gain and sensitivity and everything and then we are also able to make 100, 200, 100 meters steerable beyond this is not steerable but again like 500 meters and balance right? it's like such large this is we can make so it's like the, is this good enough actually right so our next slide I'm going to tell you that it's not really uh, good enough actually uh, because interferometry and, and what we need is that we need even higher resolution and even higher sensitivity. That's what I'm going to uh, talk about. And the solution, and, and that is achieved by interferometer. Because I already told you that 500 meter, beyond that, this becomes very hard actually to even have static. So why is that actually? So this is an image of a uh, Orion nebula. It's coming from HST, so it is a sub arc second resolution. Like, right? what resolution is like half hour second or better. <laughs> Right. So you can see a lot of structure in it. There are region where stars are forming, there are the supernova taking place. There. So all kinds of like complexity of ISM that we read about, everything is going on in this place, right? Why pick this example? This is the nearest star for me. And also anyone of us who is interested in looking at the optical sky would have seen it because even with simple binoculars, one can see uh, Orion Nebula and Orion constellation, anyone can depart the sky, right? So if you want to make an image of it, I can do something like this. I can just take my single dish telescope and point here, point like I can continue to say point and I can make an image of this. Or say that here, you push the problem, right? Why can't we just continue? The point is that uh, the angular size of Orion nebula is one degree, right? And this is twice the size of and if we take let's say GMRT 45 meter dish, substantially large per dish uh, by any standard, uh, at 1.4 gigahertz. Which is 21 centimeter in uh, the wavelength, the, this, it will have a resolution of 0.3 degrees, right? So you can see that actually it's just not sufficient, right? Even, even if I go from 45 meter to 450 meter, it will become 0.03 degrees, right? So, because when we are doing astronomy, we are 
putting together information from different wavelengths and there are these, all these different physical processes that are taking place. You want to put this picture together, right? You want to make these connections. If like I am getting HST image with so much detail at sub half second resolution and if my radio image has a resolution of let's say half a degree, it is not going to help me much in uh, improving my understanding, right? Because uh, if, uh, like S2 regions size is like 10 parsec and I'm, my image has a resolution of kiloparsecs, then what is it that? So, so there are like hundred in my single beam, there is like an H2 region supernova, everything. If even if I get a spectral energy distribution of it, I will not know whether it's a 3 3 or a single problem. It becomes a useless thing, right? So as I'm saying, at all wavelengths, we have to try to achieve a similar kind of a spatial resolution, and that's what becomes like a good thing. I mean a good system overall uh, for astronomy. So through radio interferometry, what we can achieve uh, is that we can actually synthesize, it is not physically built, a single dish of a very large size. Uh, but we can synthesize a continuous aperture using a large number of uh, large pair of uh, antennas. So how does how, how is this done actually? Right. So this is the principle of interferometry. If you want to understand, we can go back to the classic experiment of Michelson. Right? Michelson's interferometry. This was based at Mount Wilson Observatory, and it was used to do some very palpable observations, like measuring the sizes of Stars measuring the size of beta juice in particular, which was in use for the last few years. <clears throat> Would have seen it and, and, and it had a baseline of 1 to 6 meters. What is the baseline? By baseline, we mean the separation between the two antenna. And generally, even though here I mentioned it in the units of meter, but uh, we typically uh, measure it in the units of wave, right? And we have seen like how it becomes more meaningful actually to express when we express uh, separation in the units of wave. And so this is the setup. This is the, the object. Let us say you want to look at could be star in our case, and then this mirror one, this is mirror two, which is movable, and this is where we will see the fringes. And the fringes in that time was that case was observed by eye. So they observed by eye, and we know from interferometry principles that uh, it, it actually contains information about both the spatial structure and so the spectral structure that is uh, present in the radiation microphone background. Both of them, uh, but uh, we are at uh, present we're interested more in the spatial structure of it. So now, if we consider the superposition of waves from two independent <laughs> sources, let us say, just to understand what will happen, uh, what is that I'm going to detect here? So let's say this is E1, I'm writing in the complex rotation, and E2. And then if I sort of E1 plus E2, and this is a complex conjugate term, and if I carry out this operation, then I get this bit, right? And since these are two unrelated sources, this and this, right? Then of course, and this product comes is going to flow. Right? There is nothing, uh, no fringe pattern is going to be observed because these sources are mutually incoherent to each other. But now consider a slightly different uh, situation when there is one source and I am able to combine uh, a radiation along two paths. One is like coming directly to me, that is a solid line, and then another one is the dashed line. Right? So in this case, they, they will there will be some phase relationship between them. So this cross term will actually not be zero, right? So let's keep this in mind. So now consider situation that we have two incoherent sources which are related to this A and B. The same ex expression or the intensity that I was talking about, we can write it like this, right? The subscripts are representing whether it's coming from source one or two, and then A and B is corresponding to the whether it is the slit A or slit B, right? And then I will end up with following kind of terms like well, this. We will have like even A square, even B square. Right? These are the constant terms. Yeah. That, like no code, uh, or it's like it's just the intensity that is uh, coming from uh, both the sources. Then there will be incoherent terms between two sources, right? This will correspond to zero, so it should be zero. And then there will be these uh, terms which will correspond to the coherency, right? So this, so what we are getting is actually the sum of fringe patterns from the from the two sources that we have got uh, in this case, right? Uh, but uh, with, a, with the reduced sharpness, right? Because there are these additional terms which are also present, right? The first one is present here, right? Mm -hmm. So, Michelson uh, actually gave it uh, name visibility, right? That which means like how sharp the fringes are. So, I am x minus I mean, I am x plus I mean. Fringe visibility is equal to one when the source is unresolved. 
and gradually it will be uh, uh, it will be reduced as the source gets uh, drawn, right? right. And, and, and this is something what he measured in his uh, observations, right? Because uh, this is what we try to simulate here by considering like two different sources. Here. You can think of a, a, an extended source as an ensemble of large number of sources which are related to the energy of each other. And uh, just as a uh, past time, have a look at uh, this uh, CTF radiant parameter. I'm not going to talk about it, but read, uh, read about this. You, you will find that how in very early days of interferometry, uh, this was used to actually have you know, some very interesting observation. It will also give you like how some interesting things can be done in this kind of interferometry setup. So there are two ways actually we can uh, look at interferometry, like optical and radio. Why they are different? So in optical, when you are talking about channel, so when you will be looking at your optics book, microphone interferometer, you will come across like this is how it is defined, right? And then you have these two terms, and then there are these cost terms which are this is, this is what is called an addition interferometer. In at radio wavelengths, what we can do is that we can actually directly sample uh, the radiation field, which is its amplitude and it phase both. So what this means that we don't have to go through this kind of an addition operation, we can actually do the multiplication directly. For example, let us say uh, the radiation coming from here, these are my two dishes, and then I can multiply them. So to so V1, A1 cos 2 pi nu T, right? This is signal at one, and then other one, it is coming the same thing, but it is arriving at a certain delay, right? That is just coming from the geometry, right? Theta, because it's coming at a certain angle. So, and, and that delay is just V sine theta by C. So this is my visibility frame here. So multiplication in this case is actually picking only signal which is common to antenna, right? So this multiplication interferometry you can state as a C that has this advantage that it sort of actually throws away all the unwanted, undesirable things that don't want. So it is it is good. And this we are going to, I'm repeating this, this we are going able to do at radio because we are actually able to uh, sample the radiation field directly. We are able to measure both amplitude and phase. That is the important. Part of it in optical, we are detecting the state of the intensity. The working with intensity state of it, right? Uh, so you can see that uh, with this kind of a setup, it is quite obvious that this the fact that this tau g or the theta is appearing here, we can say that we tell from which direction the radiation is coming, right? So directivity part is uh, very well taken care of, and actually we can quite accurately calculate like arc second resolution and things like that, which is coming from, and if you look at the sing, single dish, uh, the resolution there was this capital D, right? D being the size of this dish. But the resolution of the interferometer is actually lambda by D, D being the baseline or separation between the two dishes, right? This is part B sine theta by C. So this is what the resolution. So what we have achieved here in, when we are looking at the fringes, uh, this way that the resolution here is lambda by d and not the d. But the field of view that we have the, is still corresponding to d, right? Because I'm still able to look at uh, that much portion of the sky. So this is uh, the first contact that we have made with radio interferometry in terms of the resolution. If you want to look at it more formally, then uh, uh, we can uh, Go through what is called Van Sitter Zernike theorem. You will find the full derivations of these in any of the, your optics books, especially Bond and Wolf. So, if we have like an extended Gaussian monochromatic source, which we can think of as like an ensemble of this large number of component sources, then radiation field at two points, E1, E1 and P2, the E1 and E2 can be written like this, right? And then we can actually uh, carry out a complex correlation. For these two points, and then go through the simple, very simple algebra, right? That you can go through, and we can talk about some of these during the hands-on experiment as well. That what does uh, some of these things mean? But what one finds uh, eventually is that if I can measure this visibility, <laughs> or the two-point correlation function, also we call it at these points one and two. Right, at these points one and two, and how we do it, we will do it using a set of dishes to a pair of dishes in this case. Then this is actually related to the 
only transform of the intensity pattern in the sky. Which is this corresponding to this expression here, which comes through if we go through this algebra. What are U and V? U and V are my baseline uh, separation between the antennas that I measure in the units of wavelength, and L and M are the direction cosines of the positions of the celestial sphere. Right? So, so this is the essence of uh, uh, it uh, that comes from the Benzinger and the theorem that um, we actually can somehow quickly sample the relation between uh, pair of points on the ground plane, right? That is U and V. Then by taking a Fourier transform of it, I can actually get what is the intensity distribution in the sky. Couple of subtleties to note before we stop uh, for now or before the second uh, lecture is that uh, we, as I told you, that the way the reason why we are able to do this is because we are able to sample, uh, record both amplitude and phase. Right? It means that for each point we need to make two sets of measurements, not just one measurement. So how does we achieve in this case, we actually, so once we take this as it is, the way I described a couple of slides before, and in another case, what we do is that we actually introduce an anti-degree phase shift, and then do this like this, so this is the sign term. So we actually make two measurements, right, because we need two physical quantities, one amplitude, another phase. So we need to make two measurements, not how we get, right. So this is achieved in the, uh, uh, by, what is called as complex correlator, and what we are measuring then is the complex visibility. It is a complex number. It has both amplitude and phase information. That's the most important thing to uh, keep in mind. That if we don't have phase term, then we are not doing it. Phase term as well, and of course we can write it like this. Some of these two, and this is what the central and negative part is, right? Relating it to the intensity, and then we can also write it like this. In the phase annotation again, is like that as well, right? So this is now. You can ask like if you, if you go back to any of these expressions, say you will see that like okay, I have not done the limits here, but these integrals or even simple Fourier transform you can go from minus infinity to infinity, right? So now we are talking about a real telescope, and you and we are real separation between the dishes. So these are all positive, right? What, how can they be negative actually? So where, where do will I get V e as a function of minus U and minus V? That it comes from the simple uh, identity here that we know that image or the intensity that we are looking at is real, right? It is real, it's a physical thing. If that is the case, then U V, because there is a Fourier transform, will be Hermitian, right? This, this is just a mathematical uh, reality. What is uh, meant by Hermitian? It means that this real part of the function is even and the imaginary part is odd. It means that after I measure V U V, I can actually uh, generate all the negative frequencies, the measurements of negative frequencies just by filling in using this identity, and that's it. Then I have measurements at both positive frequencies and the negative frequencies, right? Why frequencies are I'm, I'm using what frequencies because I'm referring to the spatial frequency, right? I realized that I started using the word frequency. So I'm not referring to frequency as a megahertz. I'm referring to spatial frequencies here because each visibility is corresponding a certain uh, clear component corresponding to structure in the sky, right? So I'm referring to the spatial frequency corresponding to that, right? So the, so the two antennas which are close by will actually be measuring, uh, will be sensitive, will be measuring the Fourier mode corresponding to the extended structure in the sky and the ones which are actually further away will be measured, will be giving you the final details in it, right? So this is why actually you would find that radio interferometers actually have large number of dishes because with large number of dishes we can measure a variety of uh, Fourier components instantaneously and then you will see that like the between this and this, the separation is large, right? So this will be measuring, uh, giving me the final detail, whereas these ones are close by, actually. So they will be actually giving, will be sensitive to uh, the more extended structure in the sky. So by combination of these two, I will actually have a sufficient dynamic range in my image, like it will help be sensitive to a uh, lot of details in the source. So resolution now comes from the longest baseline, which is not the diameter of the dish. And just by putting this 45 meter diameter over 25 kilometer, what happens that I now have a telescope which actually whose size is actually of about 25 kilometers. So this three arc second, 0.3 degrees here, this resolution 
three arc seconds at one point twenty seconds by using radio interval. This is the clever use of uh, resources. And if one has so so there so people put dishes all around there and like that in different configurations. And but but one does not know what kind of object one may want to observe in the sky. So if one has a lot of money, then one can also put dishes on rail tracks and move them. Depending on if you want to look at direct standard source in the sky, bring all the dishes together. If you want to look at only finite details, move all of them far apart, like that. So this is the kind of stuff that uh, we get, right? So what one does is that not only one puts lots of these dishes on the ground. But one also observes an object over a certain duration, right? Because if you recall, uh, the projected baseline from the as seen from the source is actually depending on where the source is in the sky, right? Because it's, the projected baseline will change, right? The same pair of antenna, if I observe source at different elevations, would give me different baseline. So what would happen that let's say this is one example uh, for an object at a certain declination. This is corresponding to like. Uh, so these black dots here represent the points where the it was possible to make the measurement, right? And you can say that like, and and this shape changes actually depending on the declination of the source. But this is equivalent to synthesizing an aperture of this this size or this extent, and and using this actually one can actually carry out the proper imaging after that. So the, you can see that like we although we have synthesized an aperture, but this aperture has got certain holes. Imperfections, right? It is not like a completely filled aperture, and that's something which we will uh, look into in detail. But nevertheless, uh, what we have concluded now uh, that instead of single dish, if you we can use a small um, use a number of smaller antennas and multiply signals in pairs electronically to sample the aperture's electromagnetic field distribution, right? And if you observe, and by using this, actually we can synthesize an aperture of much larger. Uh, Diameter, diameter which is actually equivalent to uh, the size of the size of the aperture, which is equivalent to the uh, farthest antenna that I have in my configuration, right? And this is actually achieved by simply by the arc rotation, right? So the source is moving in the sky. Right? Same pair is giving different uh, projected baseline. So Martin Ryle in 1560s after actually uh, demonstrated this practically. And, and and he was awarded a Nobel Prize for his contribution to this in 1974. You can see that like this, such a strong application. Yeah. So this is, I think this is where we will stop, right? And we will uh, start from here. Next one starts at 11:15.